folks, thanks so much for joining. Uh, Chris Neidel here. I'm the co-founder of Open Air. Uh, really excited to be joined by Pat McClellan, who's the policy director for the New York League of Conservation Voters. And the reason why Pat and I are talking today, uh, because Pat's going to be able to give us a little bit of a, a, a portrait or a picture of the effort to get a low carbon fuel standard policy implemented here in New York State. This is obviously of great interest to open air members, even if they don't know it yet, because um, embedded within the low carbon fuel standard uh, are real opportunities for scaling up some of the technologies that our community is really focused on related to carbon utilization and removal. So we're gonna hear from Pat about what that policy is, where it stands, and then end um, maybe with a little bit of conversation about how members of our community could get involved and help this effort out. So Pat, thanks so much for joining, really appreciate it. Yeah, happy to be here, thanks Chris. Great. Well, let's just go ahead and start it with the most 101 of questions. Could you just uh, give us your best concise sort of synopsis of what a low carbon fuel standard uh, is, and then maybe point to some places in the world where that policy is already in place? Sure. So a low carbon fuel standard is a performance-based standard uh, for transportation fuels. And uh, what it does, it, I mean, it's meant to address life cycle emissions from transportation fuels by setting a declining cap uh, and fuels whose carbon intensity are above a certain level have to purchase credits from uh, fuel providers whose fuels are below that level uh, and the higher the carbon intensity of your fuels the more credits you have to buy so essentially the more expensive it is for you to continue selling those those fuels that are high carbon intensity and the lower the carbon intensity of your fuels is, the more credits you're generating. So um, the more of a, of a subsidy you're getting to ramp up your operations. Um, so just as, as an example of some fuels and how that would work, typically uh, purely fossil, 100% fossil diesel is the highest carbon intensity fuels that would have to purchase the most credits under this system. Um, and then you kind of work your way down uh, lower carbon intensity fuels. So you have something like ethanol that, you know, is an additive to gasoline, lowers its, its carbon intensity. And, you know, that has one score that that's lower on carbon intensity than, than diesel and gasoline, but it's not as low as, for instance, electricity for, you know, electric vehicles. And even on that, you're looking at electricity that comes from, say, uh, a natural gas fired power plant versus electricity that's coming from 100% renewable resources, those would have different carbon intensity scores because you're looking at the full life cycle of it. But then over time, I guess it ramps down and making it increasingly tries to squeeze out the carbon. That's right. So there are, so there are fuels. So California pioneered the low carbon fuel standard a little over a decade ago. Um, it has since been adopted in Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. So it's really the entire West Coast of North America basically has, has this in place now. Um, and in, in British Columbia, the, the approach has been so successful that the Canadian government is looking at doing it nationwide now. Uh, but I digress. Uh, even in California, as the cap is starting to decline, what you're seeing is that by the end of this decade, there are certain fuel types that right now are credit generators um, that are going to become credit purchasers because uh, essentially they are right now uh, preferable to diesel and gasoline. But as that cap declines, they go above it and have to start purchasing credits. Um, so it's a great way of addressing the kind of bridge fuel problem of acknowledging that there are some fuel types that can be helpful in decarbonization uh, right now, but in the longer term are not going to be part of the, of the solution here. And so that's kind of already baked into the program, which I think is very helpful. Yeah, that's great. And so before we talk about it in New, in New York, Let's just, I guess, talk about what the policy does, both in relationship to a state's uh, particular emissions reduction goals. So how does it sort of fit into that? But I think what's exciting is it really creates a market for these alternative low carbon types of fuels and ultimately uh, neutral fuels. Uh, it's really a market generator. So I didn't know if you wanted to sort of That's talk right. about what you've seen on the West Coast and then also how is it affecting emerging low carbon fuel? Yeah. Um, so. 
in California, uh, the goal is to cut transportation, the carbon intensity of transportation fuels by 20% over a decade. Um, that's also what we have in, in New York's bill that, that has not been passed yet. And what it's done on the West Coast is stimulate the market for alternative fuels. So if you're looking at uh, something like biodiesel, which is a drop in fuel, you know, you can use it on trucks that are on the road right now. Um, and a lot of that can come from like used cooking oil um, or for renewable natural gas, which can displace fracked natural gas um, that can mostly comes from anaerobic digestion of farm waste and food waste, um, which you know on their own are enormous methane generators. And so if you can capture and monetize those waste streams and turn them into fuel that, you know, it's still combustible, it still has emissions associated with it, but that displaces fossil fuels, you know, that's really helpful. And it also boosts sort of uh, emerging sectors of non on road transportation. So, you know, in the longer run, looking at maritime fueling and aviation fuels, those are not currently subject to any kind of a low carbon fuel standard. But the market growth that's going on in liquid alternative fuels because of California's low carbon fuel standard are right now building those sectors of the market that in the longer run, you know, 15, 20 years from now are going to help us um, start to decarbonize aviation fuels as well, which is, um, you know, if you dig into it, one of the, the trickier parts of the transportation sector to decarbonize. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the things that we always within our community try to embrace and forefront is the catalytic nature of policy and how it starts to sort of create opportunities and unlock emissions reductions further down the line that wouldn't be possible right now. So it's important to look at any policy mm -hmm. not just at what it does today, but what is it sort of leading to in terms of market transformation? And that's what the LCFS seems uh, designed to do. Um, yeah. Now in, in New York, you know, I think the first time I, I heard about an effort to do this, this is a couple of years going back, I think when certainly when the yeah. assembly bill was introduced and then the League of Conservation Voters, your team is at the center of an extremely impressive and diverse coalition that represents environmental organizations, climate advocates, but also some of these emerging companies and incumbent mm -hmm. sectors as well. You want to just tell us a little bit about the history of the policy in, in New York State and where it currently stands and, and tell us a little bit about that coalition, because again, it is impressive. Yeah, uh, so the low carbon fuel standard legislation in New York was introduced in I believe the beginning of the 2019 legislative session. Uh, and we got involved because some of the private sector businesses that we've worked with in the alternative fuel space were really enthusiastic about it, uh, brought it to our attention and we kind of did the research and decided that this was an exciting policy tool to, to help in decarbonizing transportation. So we formed a coalition called Clean Fuels New York um, as dozens of members now. And, and as you said, there are environmental groups that are part of that. Um, there are companies that, that produce renewable fuels, companies that um, install electric vehicle charging stations. You know, we've seen a lot of interest from uh, public transit agencies that they are not part of our coalition, but um, they've expressed a lot of interest in it, um, as has the, the city of New York, because any kind of a fleet operator kind of immediately sees the benefit of this for reducing both their operational costs and also their uh, their greenhouse gas emissions. So where it is right now, we have majority a majority of both houses of the state legislature in support of the bill, including a majority of the majority, which is which is often uh, what you need to get a bill through. And it was also included in the Climate Action Council's draft scoping plan for how we achieve the goals of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act that requires us to reduce emissions 85% by 2050, including uh, an almost total decarbonization of transportation. And so, you know, we think that we're in a pretty good place on, on the policy in terms of winning over stakeholders. Politically, the pushback we've gotten, frankly, has been from folks who say that, you know, we need to go to full electrification as quickly as possible, that this interferes with that. You know, from NYLCV's perspective, we're fully supportive of, of zero emission on-road transportation as quickly as possible. You know, we're huge supporters of the advanced clean truck rule that New York just adopted, um, as well as the adoption of California's advanced clean car rule as well, requiring 
all new sales of passenger vehicles to be zero emission by 2035. But between now and 2035, millions of new vehicles are going to go on the road that still combust diesel and gasoline for their fuel. And a lot of those vehicles are still going to be on the road well past the 2050 date in which the CLCPA envisions that we have basically no on-road transportation emissions. And so when you're looking at, you know, a truck that gets 13 miles to the gallon and is still going to be on the road in 20 years, you need to have a solution for how to reduce those emissions. And that's something where a clean fuel standard or low carbon fuel standard is really helpful. And that's kind of just on the the vehicles that are still going to be on the road. And LCFS is also helpful in making a transition, again, especially for fleets. Um, So when you look at something like a school bus operator, for instance, that's interested in uh, switching over to electric school buses, right now the cost delta between a diesel school bus and an electric school bus um, is, is fairly large. So, you know, we were really excited that in her state of the state, Uh, Last week, Governor Hochul announced a plan for all school buses statewide to be electric by 2035. And I know that the state is trying to identify the funding streams to help make that happen. Uh, And a clean fuel standard by bringing down the real cost of purchasing uh, a new electric vehicle helps make that transition possible. And that's true across fleet operators. So school bus fleets, um, public transit operators, uh, delivery companies like like FedEx and UPS, um, any any fleet operator really would in particular see an, an immediate and large benefit from a clean fuel standard on the electrification front and on switching over their fleets. Great. And also just to bring it back and, and contextualize it a bit for, for the open air crowd, um, as you know, yep. uh, Pat, we're really focused on the scale up, accelerating the scale up of carbon removal technologies. And in the short term, very Mm -hmm. similar to some of the dynamics that you just described, we have to get these policies in place that might have a ripple effect over time of enabling other types of technologies. And so one of the key things in the short term for let's say direct air capture, you know, sort of one of the more, um, you know, well understood and fast moving carbon removal technologies we have to mm-hmm. deploy that by any means necessary. And certainly the long term is how do you use that technology to pull carbon out of the air and put it in the ground? But right now we have to look at where, where could that add value? And one of them is in fuel production. So I know in California's yeah. low carbon fuel standard, for instance, is really driving investment in direct air capture that pulls carbon out of the air that can then be combined with hydrogen from, you know, the, from electrolysis with renewable energy. And you combine it and you make a type of a, a, a non-fossil hydro um, hydrocarbon. And so, for instance, the uh, carbon engineering plant that uh, is being developed uh, in the Permian Basin in in Texas will be by far the largest DAC project of its kind. That's really only made possible because of California's low carbon fuel standards. So Mm -hmm. so for those who are trying to see the connection to open airs work and the, you know, look, the LCFS is just good climate policy, but it does in really material ways intersect with what we're trying to do around carbon removal. So that's very exciting. And that's yeah. also something that New York, as you know, Pat, is taking kind of unique steps towards. I don't think there's a jurisdiction, national or subnational anywhere in the world, that is making real bets or investments on carbon tech like New York State is. So we see a, a low carbon fuel standard, provided that it has those provisions that, you know, DAC to fuel type of uh, fuels would 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 benefit from it. Uh, it can help sort of supersize or, or give lift to, to New York's ambitions in the carbon tech world as well. So um, yep. what is it though, you, you mentioned that there, and we're seeing this, you know, too, that there's a, a real commitment to electrification, but sometimes some of the nuances and realities that you described, I think are not being sort of sufficiently absorbed by people that are resisting the low carbon fuel standards. So what's an activist that's sympathetic to the LCFS and wants to see it happen in New York to do? What is What is stuff that our citizen lobbyists and, and, and members could potentially do to, to, help, to help sort of elevate this and get it done in New York? Yeah, so I think the most important thing would be uh, getting the governor on board. You know, Governor Hochul has, has made some really bold commitments on climate that NYLCV is, is really supportive of. You know, we're, we're thrilled with everything she's had to say on, on climate issues um, since she took office. But, you know, the question with, with the state when they make 
longer term promises, you know, we're going to do X, Y, Z over the next 10, 15, 20 years is how they're going to, to pay for that. Um, and so, you know, persuading the governor that this is a, a tool in her toolbox that will bring down the cost of these transitions, I think is important. So calls and emails to the governor's office. Uh, and then for the legislature, um, you know, calls and emails to your, to your member as well, uh, asking them to really push for this bill. You know, at this point, we're in a very good place on uh, co-sponsorship, which is usually something that we ask of legislators because of the work that this coalition has been doing over the last three years. Uh, we, we have, you know, solid majorities uh, co-sponsoring the bill, but what we need are for members to uh, you know, to talk to the chair of the Environmental Conservation Committee, to talk to the speaker, to talk to other people in leadership in the state assembly and say, you know, this isn't just a bill that I'm a co-sponsor of. This is a bill that I'm passionate about. And this is a bill that we need to see uh, brought to the floor for a vote this year, because if it can get out of committee and to the floor for a vote, um, you know, we have the votes to pass it. So the bottleneck is really at the assembly at the committee level, uh, primarily. Um, in the absence of, you know, failing success there, is this something that Governor Hochul and the executive alone could potentially make a reality or does it require a legislative pathway? Uh, so that's a good question. Because it was included in the CLCPA draft scoping plan, if it is included in the final plan after 2022 will be devoted entirely to public comment on the plan and Certainly, we'll be weighing in on, on on this and plenty of other things that were that were in the draft plan. Uh, and so, if a clean fuel standard makes it into the final draft of the plan, it's a bit of an open question what DEC does then. Uh, there are folks who argue that the CLCPA grants uh, DEC and other executive agencies very broad power to implement uh, the programs that are that the Climate Action Council has deemed are necessary to implement the CLCPA. Uh, and so under that interpretation, DEC could just start the rulemaking process for a clean fuel standard. I know there are some folks too who are um, some lawyers who are a, a bit more skittish about it and think that you really need a sort of secondary authorization from the legislature for specific programs that are recommended by the Climate Action Council. The best course of action would be for the legislature to pass legislation authorizing a clean fuel standard. It sounds like if we were to boil this down, then we really, obviously the support of Governor Hochul is uh, critical. Very, very positive sign that that the LCFS got brought in, articulated and rationalized within the Climate Action Council scoping plan. That certainly helps. But if our team or our community was to, to uh, play a role here, it sounds like uh, messages and phone calls to the governor's office, but then also to the Assembly Environmental Conservation Committee uh, Chair Steve Engelbright would probably be the best utilization of our time and resources for the next couple of months. Does that sound right? That's absolutely right. Yep. Okay, great. And for your timetable, you know, we have the remainder of the session that goes till June, but I would imagine this obviously interplays with the budget decisions to a certain degree, but then you have your Earth Day moment, which in New York, mm -hmm. at least often you try to get a raft of really signature significant legislation done then. Are you guys looking at right sort of like a now till late April type, type of time frame to really get this going? Yeah, ideally we uh, would get it done as part of the budget. I, I think that's uh, the best time to get uh, issues like this done. If it's not done in the budget, then, then certainly we'll keep pushing for it as standalone legislation. But uh, with the primaries for the state legislature being in June now, it's a redistricting year. It's a gubernatorial election year. I think the sentiment is that after budget, uh, there probably are not going to be too many uh, legislative session days left. So uh, really the, the push is between now and, and early April. Great. And for our for cheat sheets and uh, resources that we could repurpose or use directly for this effort, for this outreach we want to do, where would you recommend we go? Is it the, the Clean Fuels Coalition website or what would you, what should we look at? That's right. Yeah. Yes. Cleanfuelsny.org uh, okay. is the website. And that has uh, fact sheets and case studies and other resources. Great. So what we'll probably do is actually have a little internal uh, sort of teach-in session about this uh, to help people on their way to making those calls. And we'll probably uh, pick a, a, a window of time, maybe a week to sort of maximize the volume of those calls so that they, they register. Mm -hmm. but 
This is really, really helpful. We'll include that website uh, in the show notes and really want to commend the, the league and the coalition that you put together for this is a, this is the definitive uphill battle because this is not a minor policy, even with it in the books in California, it really takes a lot of work and you guys have been really, really pushing it. And so I want to commend you for that and wish you the best of luck in this effort. And we will, uh, we're here to help in any way we can. Thanks. Yeah, we are all, always happy to work with you guys. Great. Thanks, Pat. Thank you.